Spoilers! <laughs> Spoilers! What's up, guys? Welcome to you. Here we are to do a hefty little breakdown slash spoiler discussion of chapter 251, golly, of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is known as the Uninhabited Battle. Wait, no. The Battle in the Uninhabited Demon of Shinjuku, part 23. I say it with such confidence, even though I can't see the number 20. Yeah, I can literally see it. Never mind. It's number 200. Not 223. It's number 23. But gosh, right, man. Gosh, right. Gay guy. Gay guy. You know, I'm not going to complain anymore. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to complain. It is a gay guy. All right? This, this has been a thing. This has been a thing. I don't know why I'm expecting anything different. But this chapter, this chapter is some gas. I'm actually happy there was a decent chunk between my quick spoiler discussion and this recording of the full-term spoiler discussion because there's a whole bunch of extra juicy things that were revealed to me by y'all, by further translations, by more rereads of the chapter, all that. So let's not waste any more time and let's hop right into it. Editing me. Ready? Three, two, one. Go. What's up, guys? That guy with a... Oh, shoot. <laughs> I, nearly, I nearly tore something apart. That guy with a pencil here. Fun fact, I do happen to have it on me and keep it on me at all times. And, of course, Yutsu Kotsu also tends... Oh, sweet mother of mercy. He also tends to have it on him and keep it on him at all times. And, unfortunately, while someone else also tends to... <laughs> have it on him and keep it on him at all times, this chapter's devious. This chapter is devious, ladies and gentlemen. But here's what this chapter does do. It raises a bunch of questions, but clarifies some things. Both of which are good in their own way. So let's talk first about clarification. So this opening page, surprisingly enough, has a lot to say in terms of what happens here, even though there's like, what, one, two, three, four pieces of dialogue. And what is an internal thought, and these other two do not seem like that intense pieces of dialogue. But what do I mean? First things first, this cleave, it is specifically imbued in the blade, and one thing I was low-key fearing, I was kind of scared that Yudo was going to get cleaved right back, considering, you know, Tsukuna does have the grip on the blade, or like he was going to cleave the sword or something like that, but no, that doesn't end up happening here, so Yudo's safe on that front. Two, we don't actually, at least not in this, we don't get a translation for why the eyes go red when in contact with cleave. I'm assuming, or like, even dismantle, like, Yuta's eyes went red when he got hit with the dismantle last chapter. It's probably just burst of blood vessels, if I had to assume, but like... Still interesting. The main thing here, this takes care of what was a massive, and I mean massive, lingering mystery. Something that me and a lot of the rest of the community was genuinely wondering when we were going to address. And it's a twofold issue. Number one, the conditions of Yuta's curse technique, presumably. And number two, the location of that final finger. The final finger that Sukuna had assumed Gojo kept by himself, for himself, of himself, and he did not know the whereabouts of. This confirms that Yuta went, <laughs> he devoured that thing. And that's how he, well, yeah, that's how he's able to use Cleave. I was about to say something completely different, but yeah, that's how he's able to use Cleave within his domain. This does twofold things. The bigger one, in my opinion, is taking this plot point off the table. One of the big things, one of the big reasons why me and a lot of other people were perfectly fine with this Sukuna losing, this four-armed, 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 four-eyed beast losing, was because we thought, and, and who knows, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, so you know what, I won't even speak in generalizations, the reason I thought I was perfectly fine with this guy losing, I thought that last finger was still in play. I thought Sukuna was just wrong. I thought he may have guessed that Gojo had it, but he didn't. Like, it was just a finger that was missing. And no one knew where it was. I thought maybe Kenny had something to do with it. Maybe I see a lot... Well, not see. I saw a lot of people saying it was possibly Ghetto's kids that had something to do with it. But no. Gojo did have a finger. He presumably slid it to Yuta. And Yuta ate that bad boy. Multiple interesting things are confirmed about this, though. Number one, the location of the final finger. Meaning that, especially if Yuta does end up getting got in this chapter, like a lot of people are saying he is, then number one... That finger's off the table for Sukuna. It's gone. And number two, this does kind of confirm something that a lot of people were wondering. Can two Sukunas coexist? Seemingly enough, not. Notably, in, and well, maybe. Maybe he does exist in Yuji, or not Yuji. Maybe he does exist in Yuta, but I highly doubt it. Yuta ate the finger with no drawbacks. Or at least, presumably, no drawbacks. Maybe Rika ate the finger. Once again, this will be more clarified when there are translations. But this final finger did not spawn another Sukuna. 
And notably, it didn't even register his cursed energy. Like, Sugana did not notice that Yuta was imbued with his cursed energy. Sure, Shoko noticed that Itadori was basically a living, breathing, walking, talking finger. But, notably, Yuta nowhere near recognized. Sugana never comments on it. He's completely surprised that Cleave even came out of Yuta. All that. Which means that this finger just fell into the pool. That was Yuta's cursed energy. And I was admittedly going to get a little bit annoyed with this. But number one, it makes sense that there can't be two incarnated Sukunas. Because, like, sure, that'd be a cool mechanic, but, like, how would you reconcile that? <laughs> would one Sukuna want to become the real Sukuna? Would the other Sukuna just rip the finger out of somebody else because we know they're still cursed objects? And stuff? Like, there's too much complications that comes with possible two Sukunas, so I'm glad that's confirmed. Another thing I'm glad that's confirmed, it's entirely possible that this is kind of a justified thing in the sense that, remember, Yuta Kotsu has... A bit under half. Or well, at least he's... Yuta says himself, Sukuna has around more than double the curse energy that he has. So, sure. One finger of Sukuna is still a whole bunch of curse energy. It's demonic. It's beastly. You can make an argument that one finger of Sukuna is top five in the verse. But, like, it makes sense. In terms of Yuta's drastic curse energy, and especially if the finger was swallowed by Rika. Like, if we go with... Ryu Gochigori, who ended up being right. Like, hey, as a as a person who was doubting Ryu in that one aspect, they thought bro was just game theorying, live on air. Ryu Ishigori ended up being right, at least presumably that you need to eat a piece of the person in order to develop their curse technique. Bada bang, bada wo. You know, we got it confirmed here that Yuta did consume. Presumably, it may be Rika though, because remember, Rika ate Uro's arm. And then Yuta got Sky Manipulation. That makes the turnaround even crazier, though. Like, essentially, the instant that Rika slurped down Earl's arm. Not even. Like, remember, Rika didn't actually eat Earl's arm, I don't think. I think she... <clears throat> so, like, she had some drops of juice fall into her mouth. And then Yuta got Sky Manipulation. And he knew it would work like that. So, that's very, very impressive on Yuta's part. The immediate turnaround of Sky Manipulation is wild to me. And number two, the immediate turnaround... On the idea that Yuta would not be able to be perceived as a vessel of Sukuna makes sense if Rika or him ate the finger because of how much curse energy he has. So that's good. Once again, I'm fine with this plot point being wrapped up. I'm fine with the clarification on Yuta's technique. That is a nice soft enough nerf and it explains why he wouldn't have other certain techniques. It explains why there's no idle transfiguration. Hypothetically, it explains why there's no boogie woogie or at least not a boogie woogie that's shown up all too much because, like, once again, we just have not seen Toto. Toto just might as well not be canon at this point. Though a lot of people are hoping and praying for Bro's return based on what happens in this chapter. And it makes sense why only characters who have very, very, very recently been shown, they're the ones whose techniques are appearing. Like, Inumaki, who presumably, I guess, Rika or Yuta probably ate a bit of his hair in Volume Zero, or maybe the conditions changed after Volume Zero, for Drew Shikigami. I suppose Rika just nibbled the body? Or, like, Yuta... Because, remember, he did get a drop of Drew on his face after he one-tapped him. So maybe he went, like... And then he got Drew, who was also very, very recent. Earl, obviously very, very recent. Charles, also very, very recent. The Sukuna Finger, obviously very, very recent. And Angel, also very, very recent. Presumably, I guess, once again, just Angel's hair? Because notably, Yuta wasn't there. He wasn't there when Angel lost their whole arm. So presumably, he was just like, excuse me, ripped the hair off. And then there we go. We got that. So that's neat. That's neat. It does still hypothetically leave the door open for him to have Limitless and or... Blood manipulation and or who else has appeared? Who else? We kind of run out. <laughs> we run out immediately because no one else is really. I mean, technically, if he snuck a piece of Kashima, I don't know how he would have done it. But if he snuck a piece of Kashima, um, he could have that too. Though probably he wouldn't want to use that because you know the whole body breaking down thing. We don't know how Kashima's technique would actually interact with RCT. We just don't know. But there are still other techniques he could pull out if he survives past this chapter. But, with that being the case, W stuff, W stuff for the first page alone. Second page we got to talk about. Oh, there's, there, I don't know about y'all. There's something so oddly satisfying about the impacts that Gage draws. Like, like, I can feel the force, the malice, the disrespect that comes with this mean and lean uppercut, bro. Bro put his whole back into it and just knocked the taste out of broski. Wonderful, wonderful. And notably, I'm not sure how, like, that's the thing. It's so hard. It's so hard. Pause, pause, pause. I mean, play the tape, whatever. It's so hard to determine the validity of any of this mess. Because we just don't know 
how what Suganus output is at, how that correlates to his durability. Is it the cursed energy relation that correlates to his durability and not his output? But output seems to relate to toughness, considering Sugina believes that a fresh Yuda, well, a mostly fresh Yuda, and a mostly fresh Yuji aren't as tough as Ryu. And uh, like, essentially, the big issue is yes, is it amazing to see Yuji Tadori slobber knock Sugina so hard that he clearly knocks more juice out of him than Kashimo ever did? Absolutely. What's his output looking like, though? How durable is he right now? If I'm scaling this in a cross-verse sense, where do I put Yuji? Because he scales to this Giga Fatigue Sukuna, who may be at less than half of his Cursed Energy Reserves, and his output may be super screwy. Because remember, Yuji's only worsening a problem. The main issue with Sukuna's output, to the point where it was so low, bros needed whole multi-section jump fights to start to restore his RCT output. It's was originally started by Gojo and Yuji just making it worse. So I don't know how much credit I can give to Yuji on a scaling front. On a character and in narrative front, this is fantastic. I love seeing Yuji pom, just just deck Sukuna straight in the jaw. Beautiful. Scrumptious. But the scaler man in me is like, what do I do with this? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a genuine question. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. Am I just supposed to take it as they scaled a super nerf Sukuna? I don't know. I don't know. Presumably, this Sukuna is still stronger than the 10 to 15% Sukuna, or the one that had 10 to 15% curse technique output. Presumably. But is he more durable than that one? Does the durability drop to 10 to 15% in that case, too? Because the output's lower? And is it just CT output, even though he says it's physical? I don't know. I have no clue. And considering Sukuna's not dodging any of this, it also seems real, real good, right? But at the same time, what does that mean, though? What is, what, what is the lockup here? And admittedly, I think, I can't tell. I think Sukuna does get punched here while he's still holding the cleave blade. Because just based on where his hand is positioned, I think that is the blade right there. So, like, he's locked in place. Like, how, essentially, how much credit can I give Yuji and Yuda in this chapter? And eventually, by next chapter, and heck, even by the end of this chapter, how much credit am I going to be able to give my girl? Like, my daughter. How, how, how much credit am I really supposed to be able to give her? Considering this Sukuna is going to be... Omega, Giga, crazy, next ne next level. Level next? What kind of word was I trying to say there? But next level nerf. I just don't know. It kind of ex it's ex it's exacerbates the problem. It's a good problem in terms of, like, narrative and, ironically enough, power scaling. But it's a nightmare, power scaling-wise. Because, like, yes, is it good that Sukun is so Giga nerfed that they actually stand a chance? Absolutely. If this was a full power Sukuna, they're all getting one tapped. And if they didn't get one tapped when this was a full power Sukuna, then it wouldn't make sense. And it would be plot induced stupidity. Like, I mean, well, like character induced stupidity. Whatever you want to call it, it would be nonsense if they weren't getting one shot. But at the same time, that leads to nowhere or anything else. Like, if this Sukuna can't one shot them, and he's clearly nowhere near full power, and Cursed Energy doesn't actually correlate to your output amount or anything, we just know his output is very, very screwy, to the point where Yuta and Yuji can take his hits and deal damage to him, what does that mean? What what version of Sukuna do I scale him to? If you go with finger scaling's irrelevant, I mean, this is still good, but then again, could mean nothing. If you go finger scaling, I don't know where to put this Sukuna. Ten finger, I guess? Because it's twenty finger, and he's at, like, Yuta's Cursed Energy, he's less than half, so, like, eight to nine finger, ten finger Sukuna? I mean, that's fine. It's neat enough. But even still, what does that mean? Does it just mean stronger than Jogo? Oh, wait. Everyone here is stronger than Jogo. Well, not everyone. Like, Eno and Kusakami are. But, like, most characters here are stronger than Jogo. So, I don't know. This is a very... It's so messy on the scaling front. It's kind of... It's, ironically enough, it's the inverse of the usual problem that we get towards the end of a lot of series. So... For clarification, what I mean by that. A lot of series undergo what I like to call the GFPC. The Great Final Power Creep. Notice how series like Dragon Ball, series like Naruto, series like Bleach, series like... I can't say One Piece, because One Piece is nowhere near ending. But like, heck, series like Moggy, Seven Deadly Sins, um... I was gonna say Sinbad no Boca, that's just more Moggy. But essentially, it's a phenomena where towards the end of a series... Characters will be at around this level, either inverse or especially crossverse, and suddenly they'll jump to the moon. Just because it's the final arc and we need to raise things. The biggest culprit of this is Magi. Where, no spoilers, they go from like planetary to star level at best, all the way up to complex multiversal and possibly beyond for some characters. So like, 
There's massive leaps. It happened in Bleach 2. It happens in Naruto 2. It happens everywhere. But, like, this is the inverse problem. Where we do have a character who transcends the entire series. And that characters are now slowly jumping up to. But this character's been nerfed to oblivion. So I just don't... I don't know. I don't know. How valid am I supposed to take any of this? Am I just supposed to take this as, like, nonsense? Do I just keep characters at where they kind of scaled before? Because this Sukuna clearly isn't a Sukuna that's really viable. I don't know. Do all these characters still just scale above Kashima? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a weird phenomenon. But, of course... We see Sukuna, he starts yapping, and then Yuta, I didn't realize this, thank y'all for clarifying this for me, I think Sukuna begins to chant, right, but I, actually no, there are no like quotation marks around it, so he's might, maybe not chanting, but he does go to start speaking, and Yuta Okotsu, in just one of the most metal moves this side of the Mississippi, is like, who gave you, who gave you the right to that tongue, bucko, and he literally, I didn't even... Okay, notably it doesn't happen here. But look where Yuta strikes. At first, I just thought he gave the belly a big old pet. I thought he was like, hey, oh, like <laughs> Notably, I don't think that's how you make somebody throw up. Like, you, you go, you don't, you don't lower palm strike them. You, you like, you like bury in their gut. But Yuta goes and grabs it. But remember this for later, because you know I got to talk about a crazy thing here. Yuji Isadori. Once again, he's with some of the some of the smoothest wombo combos. Bro hits the meanest uppercut, the uppercuts of the heavens on Ryom and Sugana, only to immediately grab Bro by the domer. It's like hold this knee for me. Boom! Drags him down into it, which is once again crazy. What does it mean though? Scaling wise, Yuji stronger than Sugana? Hmm? 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 Let me know. But with that being the case, he drags Sugana in here. And I will give credit, because I've seen it in some people, a lot of people, I, I'm not even sure if I can call y'all Sukuna fans, because y'all are trading up real quick. Like, like bro didn't cook this chapter. Like, I know he got pierced in the back by the end, and he got literally vaporized, or nearly vaporized this chapter, but I I feel like it's weird, but I have to come to Sukuna's defense here. Sukuna's not looking like trash right now. He's still cooking everybody. Like, like he's still doing fantastic, considering the circumstances at hand. Bro still has brain damage. He's losing body control. His soul is getting knocked out of whack. He's burnt a whole bunch of his cursed energy. He's five domains down. Like, not, not five. I think, like, four domains down. A whole technique that, like, bro's been going through it. So the fact that he's still doing all this to characters who came out at him mostly fresh, if not flat out fresh in the case of Yuta, well, I guess Yuta teleported and one-tapped Kenny and swung his sword around a few times. So, like, 99% Yuta... And a fully fresh Yuji, and a fully fresh Choso, and a fully fresh Ino, and a fully fresh Kusakabe, and a fully fresh Maki, and a fully fresh... Like, and just go down the list of characters who have shown up fully fresh. So, I still think Sugan is doing fantastic, and this is one of the major examples of it. Sure, does he get grabbed and knee directly in the face? Of course. What does Sukuna immediately do? He says, where my hug at, bro? And immediately gets Yuji in the chokehold? Like, he, he little bros him. Like, I... Last time Sugana did something disrespectful, he gripped up Yuji like a marmot right on the belly and just tore his guts out. But <laughs> Sugana literally, I've been seeing a whole bunch of twin AU stuff. Like Yuji and Sugana as twins, I've been seeing a whole bunch of that AU. This is the example of that. He literally little bros him where he puts him in a headlock and says, It's touching time. And immediately goes the cleave bro part. Once again, I will admit this goes to show how low bro's output is, or at least to the point where nothing like nothing too crazy happens from this like sure yuji does get his whole torso torn up but remember this was supposedly Sukuna's win condition and unlike last chapter where well you know a certain somebody came out with cursed speech and started working bro like mink 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 like started to hold him down with cursed speech and knock him around a little bit no Sukuna comes here he grabs yuji he puts the palm on his chest. He literally starts to cleave him. He successfully cleaves him. And sure, Yuji whoop, spits in his mouth. But it's after the cleave has gone off. There's no interruptions here. Yuji, I mean, he doesn't tank it, clearly. He, look at the damage bro did. But, like, he survives. The cleave. The cleave. You know, the thing that was meant to one-shot him last chapter. Not, not what? Let's see, how many hits does Yuji land before he just eats this cleave? One. Two. So with two hits, Cleave went from a lethal one-tap technique to something that does do extreme damage, but clearly isn't too lethal. At least not drastically. On Yuji. Now, of course, you can definitely chalk this up to Yuji's, like, Sukuna resistance, because technically he is a Sukuna finger, meaning Sukuna's attacking Sukuna, <laughs> legally speaking. But still, that's kind of crazy, since Sukuna himself was very confident a Cleave would have gotten up about it here, but it clearly doesn't. But of course, 
Now, let me see. Let me see. I'm not exactly... I'm not fully sure. I saw people make a certain claim, and I believe it, because, hey, I'm happy to be right. But let me see. I think, yeah, I think he does use it. I didn't even notice that. Because let me see. He doesn't do... Yeah, because that's that's Yuda, I do believe. Yeah, that's Yuda. So, oh, is it this? Yeah, okay, we'll get we'll get to it in a second. We'll get into it in a second. Th this isn't it. This isn't it. But if I have to admit, later reveal aside, or not reveal, we've been known this. If you if you didn't know that a certain someone had blood manipulation, I'm sorry. You've been reading the series with your eye. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I, I, I very specifically remember seeing a commenter being like, hey, the only reason I don't like saying Yuji doesn't have blood manipulation is it's not been explicitly confirmed, and everyone's been yelling at him like it is confirmed. So I'm not, I'm, I'm going to gloat. Because your boy's been wrong a lot recently. <laughs> so I'm, I'm more than I'm gonna gloat a little bit. It'll be a little bit of glowing. A little bit of glowing. So don't get don't get too nuttle with me. It's gonna be a little bit teeny tiny bit of glow <laughs> glowing. But with it being the case, this blood manipulation aside, metal is all get out, dog. Can you imagine you're in the middle of a battle and someone hits you so hard that juice is pouring from your mouth? It is just drooling out. And your immediate instinct, after they hit you so hard, your internal life is dripping out of your mouth like a cool, not a, like a soda machine. That your first instinct is to, and like notably, this isn't just a, like, I've hocked a loogie before. Once or twice, especially for a joke, like I've had, not doing that in here, I'm not spitting around my room. But with that being the case, I've, I've hocked a loogie or two in my day, in my day. But like... Yo, yeah, <laughs> this is crazy, this is crazy, in fact, it's so crazy, I realized I made a drastic mistake in editing me, I apologize, you're gonna have to figure that one out, <laughs> I'm gonna fix it now for editing me, but I know editing me is gonna have a nightmare, because I just realized what I failed to do, but with that being the case, because we ain't restarting, we're in too deep now, we're way too deep, if I know this is like two minutes in, I would have restarted, but we're 20 minutes deep, so I gotta keep going, but with that being the case, he like, projectile launches now once again this could be chalked up to bm blood manipulation this could be that the reason he like like pressurized water hoses it at Tsukuna. and like i love how disgusted Tsukuna looks here he's like Ew! i was literally inside you do i have to put a pause on that do i have to put a pause on that nah it's so, not like i was literally inside you and i still don't want you spitting on me but like yo, yo tell me tell me why Tell me why this is so disrespect. Like it's it's like getting humbled into immediate disrespect right back. Like imagine imagine you're fighting somebody and you and you get a real clean hit on them, a real nice smooth move on them, and they just <laughs> yeah, and just spit in your face. <laughs> and like intentionally, not accidentally. Like I, I've seen it where people like they get hit hard enough and they just spit up on reflex. This was intentional, y'all. Look look at the determination in that man's eyes. Pro was Pro knew what he was doing. <laughs> Respects to Yuji. But of course, we see Yuda being like, I cannot let you keep hitting my bro like this. We are main character on main character right now. And he hits Suga, which is the cleanest uppercut. And the reason I love this one so much is because he very specifically weaves beneath Sukuna's arm here. Look at the look at the space. Look at the gap here right here. There's barely any space here. You to clean no curse technique, no nothing. He ain't got star rage imbued. He's not thin icebreaker in Sukuna. No, bro said, hey, I may be physically weak without cursed energy. But let me show you how strong I am with it. And hit Sukuna with the meanest uppercut this side of the Mississippi. Bro, what is this? Like, the Jumpsu Kaisen is going crazy right now. But of course, we see Yuji Tadori. <laughs> and like, yeah. Bro did have his whole torso torn up by the King of Curses. I cannot knock Bro's hustle. The one thing I am genuinely still wondering, what are these? What are these for? Like, clearly, if, if you can go back and read the previous chapters, I made videos talking about it at this point. But clearly, these things are immune to Sukuna's technique. Like, we've, like we've seen. We've seen whole dismantles be launched at them. And y Yuji just goes... Like, he just knocks them away. So, like, we know there's something that comes... Here. I wonder if editing me is going to have a nightmare. I'm trying to, like... He's probably he's probably still gonna want to reach through time and execute me. I, I can I can sense editing me's fury. He's he's very I can hear him screaming like TFS Vegeta across the timeline. Like I I, I know he's mad. But with that being the case, 
Yuji, he is dripping like crazy. Once again, I presume he RCTs through this because, like, he looks very, very much better than he should after taking that much lethal damage. But, once again, Rico tagged out for a little bit. She was like, hold on. I need to regrow this arm real quick. She regrew the arm and immediately gets to work. So, like, I can't... Someone mentioned it. Hold on. In fact, I have the Googler with me. I'm running to the comment section of the quick spoiler discussion. <laughs> hold on. Where is it? What does what does Rika do here? Someone explained it. What does Rika do here? Ah, so it's Sukuna goes to the Zenin. Soul damage. What is happening? Where is it? Where is it? I know someone told me. I know someone told me what Rika does here. What does Rika do? Please, please show me the way. I'm begging you. I'm begging you right now. Where is it? I think Rika. See, I want to I want to keep scrolling because someone specifically corrected me, and like I know it'll be clear by the time I get like actual better looking scans. It looks like Rika grabs him here, and like the rose. Oh, I see. Oh, that is. I didn't find the comment, but yo, I just really, I think I understand what Rika literally picked up Suka. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm reading this wrong, and feel free to correct me. I've made mistakes before, I've made mistakes today, I'll make mistakes tomorrow, and I'm probably making a mistake right now. But, like, I think Rika literally picks bro up like a doll and beats him into the ground. And, like, on the bounce back of the hit, like, I think she straight skips bro like a rock. Or on the bounce off of the hit, Yuji goes in for a manji kick. <laughs> the way they're comboing this man is crazy, bro. Like, I know... He's earned it. But this is wild. Like, this is... Like, imagine getting jumped like this. Like, I know. If you're the four-armed, four-eyed perfection of Jujutsu, King of Curses, getting jumped like this is a regular occurrence. But, dog, Imagine you, you're fighting, like, three dudes. And one, like, seven-foot, 400-pound dude picks you up by your ankle, bounces you off the ground, and then the lean, muscular dude, he's like 5'9", but 200 pounds, 250 pounds soaking wet, straight, lean muscle, drop kicks you in your face off the throw-off. Like, they're, they're doing bro day. <laughs> but once again, I gotta give pure respect to Sukuna, because look at the grip. I have to put pause on that one. But, like, look at the grip. Bro has not undone this pose to save his life. Quite literally to save his life. But he's literally holding that tight, bro. That is that is legendary in of itself. The amount of determination and willpower it would take to hold your hands together after you got ragdolled and bounced like this? Wild. Wild. Insane. Buku bonkers, if you will. But speaking of buku bonkers, <laughs> you don't waste no time. This is it. I, how did I not know? Yuta literally says what? You feel like chancing? Not with that mouth. He reaches... How nasty is that? Like, notably... I'm not touching my tongue. Not in the sense that it's nasty, but like... I, I was just tongue texture. Well... No, I know cheek texture. I don't know tongue... I'm not touching it, but it like... I, no, no, I'm not. But... Can you, like, imagine the, and look, you can even see Sukuna tries to stop Yuta from grabbing it. <laughs> but Yuta literally reaches into Sukuna's mouth and tears on his tongue. <laughs> what kind of metal, yo? yo. <laughs> what is Spurs on, like, I, I've been, I've had a video sitting in the back of my mind for a while now that I'm, I'm probably going to make soon, especially if Yuta ends up actually being confirmed God here. I don't think he, I like, maybe it's just, it's the copium Huffer in me. It's the same guy that was having copium, Gojo copium for a while now. So it's the Yuta Copa in me. That makes me think he lived at the end of this chapter, which we'll get to. But like, a video that's been sitting in the back of my mind for a while now is Yuta is the rawest character in JJK. Like, despite having one of the best curse techniques, he's just like pure metal energy. Like, bro will throw himself into attacks, so brute force heal through your attacks, and then grab you by the face, spit in your mouth with RCT, and detonate your head. Bro will also then grab your head with a palm of RCT and detonate it. Bro will go ban for ban with somebody, confirm stronger than him, get knocked away, thin ice breaking into the ground, stand up, crack his neck, slide a ring on, and keep by. Like, Yuta Kotsu is just metal. Super raw. This is Yuta Kotsu's rawest moment. Last chapter had possibly my favorite Yuta moment where he just said we cheated. 
I love that. I love that. I love that moment for Yuta. But at the same time, in terms of just sheer raw metal energy, how many of y'all are doing this? Say I give you the same stats, the same abilities, everything is Yuta Kotsu. I throw you in this scenario. How many of y'all actually have the gall, the gumption, and the nerve to reach in, grab the and like realize he doesn't use a sword? He doesn't use a curse technique. Bro literally reached into the belly mouth, gripped up the tongue with his bare hands, and ripped it out. Like y'all, like y'all, we're seeing we're seeing the same vision, right? Like like we're, like we're locked in on the same thing. Like he straight rips out his tongue with his bare hand. He's metal. He's mad. He's him. He's like, I I want to sincerely apologize to everyone who thought I was a Yuta hater. And for coming across as a Yuta hater. But I, I, I love the dude. And it's for moments like this. Because golly bro. And notably he still takes the punch. Like Sukuna does throw him off. But it's too late by that point. Because he literally eats it. Though notably look at this. He takes damage from Sukuna. But he's like that didn't hurt as much. I don't have to heal that much. It's time to lock in. And he immediately charges. Once again it's my, fa it's my favorite aspect of you. It's honestly... Any character who can regenerate, if you want to make me like them a whole lot, this goes for any character. Like, Seven Deadly Sins comes to mind a lot because it literally has Bon the Undead, Bon an immortal character. But there are a bunch of moments in Seven Deadly Sins where Bon or Meliodas or any character who can regenerate, they will take, like, a massive blow, especially to the head, just like this. They will be knocked back. They're, you'll see their juice splurt every... I need to find another word other than juice to avoid saying the B word. Which I say all the time. I say, I say blood. Blood and blood. Like, you see the life juice spark straight out of their head, and instead of being deterred, they will heal, They will lunge forward, steam curling off their face, or darkness curling off their face, and lunge right back in. Instant way to make me like a character who can regenerate. Just make them be metal, and not have to use the regeneration pa passively, or heal in place and then run in. Have them run in as they heal like Yuta does. Beautiful. Fantastic. And we see that Yuta Kotsu, since he notices that Tsugana's technique is dropping, he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Hold on now. It's on the press, bro. And he, I think he grabs a katana. This is even crazier. Because he has a katana in this very next page. And he's, I think he straight up slap. yeah, he slashes Tsugana with it. So, bro, on the knockback, after grabbing Tsugana's tongue out, bro, threw the tongue to the side, gripped up on the nearest katana, lunged back in mid-heel, and said, give me that other mouth, boy. He said, you can't have one or the other. You ain't chanting for nothing. And swings and cle Like, once again, this is crazy. He tears Sukuna's whole mouth. Like, remember the slight gash that led to Yuji's now iconic scar on his lip? No, bro doesn't have cheeks anymore. Bro's looking like... What's that character's name? What's that character's name? What is that character's name? They have the... They, bro's looking like Joker. Like, the Dark Knight Joker. Like, I don't know how I got these scars. Like, like that long, extended, ripped mouth. There's another character I'm thinking of. Like, don't... I will not remember the character's name. It's from an anime or manga. I know it is. I'm forgetting the character's name like anything. And I know the character's name like anything. But if there's a character that y'all know that has, like, a split, extended mouth, tell me. I'm forgetting it right now, but I'm going to remember the moment I, I turn off the camera. But with that being the case, Terry's took his mouth straight open. But once again, I'll give credit. This, this is a chapter where I'm consistently giving credit to everybody. There's not a single player in this chapter who I can't glaze even in just a little... Well, there's one. There's one. But it's good character writing. For the one that I'm going to slander, note, I like it for the character writing. But I have to give respect to Sukuna here, bro. In the midst of... While he's losing control of his body, as he can no longer RCT effectively, as he realizes that he's on the verge of genuinely perishing, bro's like... <sighs> he gets his mouth torn straight open and throws out the dismantles anyway. And look at the gamble bro did. He throws out the dismantles with the lower hands. Bro unclaps here. very specific. At least I think. This is supposed to be the lower hand because I see the upper arm here. So he... He let go of Hollow Wicker Basket. He was so ready to risk it all, he threw out Hollow Wicker Basket and was like, nah, hold this for me real quick. But Yuta Ogotsu, let me just say, Yuta, not Ogotsu, but Ogotsu, he lunges in, blade in hand, is like, let me cook. And bro, Emil, I think he gets hit with, yo, this is it. Sukuna's face literally, his second face 
detonates. I don't know how I didn't notice this. I must have just, this is what happens when you try to move at the speed of light. This is why I like to go slow. If you wonder why I yap a whole bunch, it isn't just because I like to yap. No, it, that is a very big reason. It's also because I miss stuff whenever I go way too quickly. Itsudori Yuji is hard confirmed to have blood manipulation. Supernova. Stay hydrated. Fun fact. Become a patron or a member for as low as one dollar a month for a patron and low as three dollar a month for a member. And you can get access to the live reaction to this very chapter. And also, you become a $25 patron or a $25 member. If you like my yapping, if you want to get my opinion on something, if you want me to make a video on a character who I some leave, for some reason keep dancing around, don't be afraid. Become a $25 patron or a $25 member and you can request to make, make me make any video you want. Literally anything. The only limit, it can't be 10 hours long. It can be 9 hours and 59 minutes, but it cannot be... But no, I'm kidding. But I'm not kidding about the making a video part. $25 patron, $25 member, you get a free video. Well, not a free video, you're paying for it. But like, still, that's how you get it. If you want a certain video for me, get a $25 patron, $25 member. But locking back in, Yuji Tadori's blood manipulation. Like I said, we've been known this. Like, the moment it was revealed he was training with Choso and Kama, and that Kama was a better teacher, it was confirmed he had blood manipulation. Let's be real, y'all. And... <laughs> I, I mentioned him earlier, but let, let me go into him. Society, society called me crazy. They said that there's no way it could have been Yuji Itadori who fired off that piercing blood because of the angles. And they just suddenly believed that Shoso, a man who not got one but double donutted, he could get up, sprint all the way to the battlefield, climb to the top of a nearby building, fire off one piercing blood, and then never appear for multiple chapters after the fact. And he's the one who used the piercing blood, not the boy who was confirmed to be training with Choso and Kamo to learn how to use piercing blood. So I'm happy. I'm very happy that I was right. I managed to actually predict something properly and know that Yuji Itadori, he has blood manipulation. And I'm quite excited. The one thing is, though, he does not have his claws in this panel. Very notably. They are, that is a regular hand. Is it a toggle thing? I don't know. But presumably, presumably, he got this from eating the siblings. This is, like, it's, it's not confirmed how he got blood manipulation, but man, Hazard, I guess. He went, no, 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 On his siblings. On his siblings. His, his kind of siblings. Like, Chos wasn't really. Chos wasn't really. Chos wasn't really. But, like, he kind of, close enough. He ate his siblings. All right, that, he, I'm not saying Yuji ever had an innate technique of blood manipulation. I don't think he ever did. He's not a cursed W. He's not one of them. So, like... I think he just ate the cursed W's, so that's why he got blood manipulation. W stuff, W stuff, W stuff. And I love how he uses it, too. Bro hits him with the two-stage setup. Bro really... Bro's really playing Napoli and Fighters. Bro set a trap. Bro's playing Jacko Valentine. Bro set a trap. Bro's playing... Millia Rage. Hitting with a 50-50. But it's like, why didn't I go three... Those characters... Nothing. Well, kind of alike. They all trap. But with that being the case, the two-stage setup of the... Into the... Is fantastic, and then we get to see something crazy. Sugana's arm just goes flying straight off. Bo realizes that Bro got boomed by Yuji Tadori, and Yuta gives him no quarter. But we cut away back in time. So, Soul Book, Soul Book, Soul Book, Soul Book, Soul Book. This was a plot device. I mean, yeah, plot device set up by Yuki Sukumo in order to guarantee and explain and extrapolate on how Yuji Tadori was going to evolve his soul abilities. And this is fine. Notably, Yuki was established to be studying humans very, very much. I do, I think, <laughs> ironically, you know, no, 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 because it's a, it's a big part of Yuki that the evolution of humanity by breaking away from cursed energy, that was a big thing about her. And notably, the whole soul body dynamic has been established for a long time. So Yuki, essentially, like... What is Yuki's purpose? Because personally, I believe Ghetto would have fallen without Yuki. I know a lot of people blame Yuki for Ghetto's falling. And I agree, it may have been the straw that broke the camel's back, but I don't think you could actually blame Yuki for that. Ghetto was on the wrong track anyway. He was going to fall anyway. So technically, you can't give Yuki that purpose. She saves everyone in Shibuya. There you go. She saves characters like Chosun. So like, she has that one point in Shibuya. But realistically, the Yuki versus Kenny fight is pointless. I mean, it made Choso a bit stronger, but look what Choso did. <laughs> <laughs> look what lack like look what Chozo did. I mean, I guess Chozo may have perished to Tengen, 
Yeah, yeah, Chosa would have l- perished. But then again, it was Combo who ended up teaching Yuji anyways. Like, I mean, no, Yuki's kind of useless, but with this book, she is retroactively made not useless. And it's a book that it makes it, it makes sense that she has this within her established character and her character interest. So, we're, we're going to give it a W thumbs up. We're going to give, give it praise. So, with that being the case, we get an explanation of the souls and how soul dichotomy works. And then Angel, someone who's in a soul biosis, essentially, explains how this could actually work out if the soul book and the techniques imbued into it or the ideas imbued in it are used properly. Essentially, Jacob's letter works by targeting evil, negativity, malice, cursed energy. And so well, not cursed energy in general, but curse, negativity. So... Once again, I made this comparison in the review, or in the quick spoiler discussion, but I'll make it again. Essentially, right now, not right now, considering what happened to, to Meguna, or Sukuna in Megumi's body, but the moment Megumi got submerged in the bath, and especially once he got Samuki, essentially think of a big old bear hug between Sukuna and Megumi. They were locked in, like brothers from the same mother. They were together. But, notably, what Hana explains here is that you can never really, like, properly merge two souls. It's kind of like, what's a comparison? You know how you can mix, I think it's, uh, not is it oil and water? I forget what the two compounds are. But I believe it's like oil and water. You can put them in together. You can pour them at the same time and they will instantly separate out. So essentially, what Megumi and Sukuna were in, they were in that, like, pseudo-mix state. Like, they're, they were kind of moving and grooving around each other. Sukuna, by doing the bath and getting rid of Samuki, those ended up making the sta- the mixture a little bit more stable. Like, hypothetically, if you were to insta, like, liquid nitrogen freeze, that oil and water combo. But, what Yuji can do is essentially break the cracks of that fusion break it down by consistently punching at the soul boundary so the water and oil dissipate and they're on top of each other and but they're split apart and then jacob's ladder would attack the oil in this case whereas before where the oil and water were mixed and the water may have been sacrificed along with the oil now it's most likely that the oil will take all a majority of the damage, while the water may take a little bit of damage, making Jacob's Ladder a viable option. Though admittedly, once again, Hana, why weren't you at the Kenny fight? <laughs> like, 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 logistically, like, why, notably, Hana could have played an easy role, but then again, I get it, because we need to have, if, if Hana's there, then we can't have merger threat. Because the thing is, if Hana was there at Kenny's whole thing, she could have, like, off Kenny just by existing around him. Realize that Kenny's operating on a technique for one, and two, by the time you did decapitate him, if a Jacob's ladder immediately popped down, every single curse spirit would have been atomized. Most likely, including Tengen, ironically enough, or at least Kenjaku wouldn't have been able to escape and then free Tengen. So Angel fumbled in multiple ways, and she's gonna fumble again later in this chapter, indirectly. But with it being the case, the soul split is explained, and I'm not talking about the katana, as we see what happens here. And notably, I is she biting down on bro? I just realized she's genuinely biting down on bro, that's why. So wait, 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 who cuts off Sukuna's arm here? I actually can't tell. I think it's Yuda, Yuda, Yuda. I think it's Yuda. I think it's Yuda who cuts off the arm here. He slashes Sukuna's arm off. And then, now that Sukuna's lower arm is gone, and Rika currently has bro restraint on numerous levels, like, she has the upper arms held apart and is biting down into Sukuna to lock in. Crazy determination. How many... I was about to ask, how many of y'all biting into Sukuna? I've seen my comment section. I've seen other comment sections. I feel like a lot of people are biting down into Sukuna. So, let me not even ask that question. But biting down into Sukuna, as Yuji has his other arm in that hold. And notably, I love how smart they are here. Well, actually, no, Rika got isn't. Like, I mean, maybe Sukuna's fists are gripped up, but, like, she's exposing herself to massive danger here. If he just cleaves, they're cooked. But, of course, everything's exposed now. There is no Hollow Worker Mask in protecting Sukuna. And I guess this goes to show that Yuda may have not had the sure hit turned on, or at least not anywhere near to any potent degree. So Sukuna was kind of just burning time using Hollow Worker Basket, because he's not immediately hit here. And then Yuda's like... <laughs> and he just immediately drops Jacob's ladder. And I love how there's not a word said. It's all internal. He's like, Jacob's ladder. Maximum output. Fly this man! And the heavenly light comes in to cut Ryomin Sukuna. Once again, though, goes, I, I'm saying this is 
testament to Yuta's abilities. I know a lot of people are sick and tired of me glazing Yuta Okotsu, but isn't this what you wanted? What's wrong? Didn't you want to hear me glaze the new strongest sorcerer of the modern day? Huh? Huh? I'm finally glazing him because he deserves it. But with that being the case, look at this. Rika's still holding Sukuna. No worse for wear, while also being in the light. Though. Like, at least it's... The way the reason I'm so shocked by this is because the sure hit is portrayed like this. Notably, if it was just the light appearing on Sukuna, like, it was just there on him exclusively, then I could understand it. But no, this is a massive beam of light that you can see visibly char Sukuna. And notably, <laughs> Yuta... <laughs> that opportunist, bro. Because it looks like he hits him with one clean shot. Of maximum output Jacob's ladder. He doesn't keep the sure hit going. Because he lunges in. And immediately tears off the other arm. As Sugun is cooking around. And the arm goes flying. And Yuji Tadori. He reels back. And let, let, let's watch the vision here. Let's watch the vision here. Number one. Some per someone brought up a good point. Because I think I mentioned this quickly. In this quick spoiler discussion. I wondered why Yuji didn't keep it up. Right? Like clearly it's not going to harm Rika. Clearly, Yuji was fine being hit by it, and now Sukuna's arms are down. Why not just keep it going, and then have Yuji punch more and more and more, and then have Sukuna himself just be erased, like Sukuna himself feared in 250? But, some people brought up the point that technically, maybe Sukuna would still perish, and like his body would be vaporized, so maybe that's why Yuji didn't go for it. So I'll go with that explanation, because otherwise, it doesn't make sense why he didn't just keep attacking here. But we see Yuji Tadori, he pulls up with that Jajan Ken, and he lunges and punches Sukuna right on the chesticle. And we see, in the darkness, a certain someone. I I can't unsee it now. I've seen the memes, gosh darn it. Why is he still doing the Maharaka post? <laughs> like, it's very loose, don't get me wrong, and it immediately breaks here. In fact, you could argue this and this are the same position. It's just, like, slightly different angles. But someone pointed out that this looks like a low-handed Maharaga pose, and I've been unable to get the image out of my head this entire time. But, of course, I said it before. Say it again. Bag me for girl. He sold. If he had woken up right here, if he had taken back control, everything would have been worth it. Yuta would still be alive. Maki wouldn't have to come in and jump like this. Yuji Tadori's job would have been fulfilled. All this, all that, here's the thing. I was working under the pretenses of a quick review or a quick spoiler discussion, so I couldn't go too in-depth on this and my actual thoughts on it. This is fine on a character level, all right? Like, Megami, probably considering he was asleep, does not know what has been happening for him. Heck, he may not even know that he off Gojo. Well, he may not even realize that. So at least in the translations I saw, the main reason he mentions giving up and not wanting to fight back and not wanting to wake up it's because he off Samuki. He doesn't even mention Gojo. So, like, he may have just been in a fugue state this entire time. Plus the unlimited void. So, though, admittedly, cool note, cool detail to note here. He's not Lobotomy Kaizen. <laughs> I should say it like that. But he's not. He's not Lobotomy Kaizen. He's, he's just fine. Well, not just fine. But, like, he's mentally not there. But he's mentally there in the sense that he has these thoughts of guilt and doesn't want to wake up. Meaning if those unlimited voids didn't do jack. Like, what? <laughs> My bro got hit with at least nine minutes of that stuff, and it did nothing. What in the world? <laughs> Megami, what's your soul made out of, bucko? That's crazy. I don't know. I don't know who finds that crazy. He, like, he, there's no, like, it's like the Unlimited Void didn't even happen. Like, what was there? Once again, I still find it weird that Unlimited Void attacks the soul at all, but I can see it because it was hinted at with Mahito being affected, right? Like, if I go way back when, and I think about it that way, it's been hinted that... A limited void can attack the soul. It's like, it, it was hinted way back when, but what does it even do to the soul? And here's the thing, Mahito was still affected by the 0.2 second domain, to the point where he was paralyzed, even though it scraped, I guess, skipped over his brain if he had one and attacked his soul. So I still don't know how Megami recovered perfectly, but hey, that's fine. All that aside, Megami is lost. And the sauce. And the darkness. And the guilt. And the agony. And he's also 15. Maybe 16. I think he's 16 now. But he's 16. The blessed man, potential man's been going through it. So, of course, this is the most logical reaction. And it makes sense that they wouldn't consider it. Because, like, they wouldn't... I don't even think they know. They don't know about Samuki being... Well, they know, like, usually know Samuki got turned into Yorozu. But I don't think he knows that Sukuna went on a side quest and off Yorozu. Specifically with Megami's technique to specifically sink Megami's soul even further. He does not know that. 
No one did. That's a, that's one case where I can't chalk it up to them just being stupid and not talking for their entire month of prep time. That's just something they didn't know. They didn't know what kind of state Magnum was going to be in. Heck, after the Unlimited Voids hit and it was real, that's how it worked, I'm shocked they thought any of this would still work. If anything, I would have made the assumption that I and many others made that Megami was lobotomied and thusly would not be able to function properly at all, even if they were to reach him in his soul. But they still went for it. So clearly they had deeper intentions, hopes, plans, and dreams than I did. But with that being the case, it makes sense that he's sad. And it makes sense that he doesn't want to come out from the darkness. And it makes sense that he's basically given up. Because he's lost everything. Think about it. Think about it realistically. Who did he have? Samuki. His mom's gone. He didn't He didn't even know his dad. Or at least he did very shortly according to some volume extras. But he doesn't remember his dad. Heck. Once again, I can't tell because we don't have the translations. And this seems like a very short panel interaction where Yuji and Megami talk here. But presumably, he probably does know he just offed his sensei. Like, he has nothing left. Of course he is Yuji. But like, consolation prize. He's known Yuji for six months. And, that, and like... No, not, I think like eight months. And out of those eight months, Yuji was like gone for six of them. Or more. I forget I forget what the ratio of Yuji being cooked was. Like pre-Goodwill into Goodwill. I forget what the gap is there. But Yuji, he barely knows Yuji. We, as a fandom, like to go with the idea that Yuji, Megami, and Nobara were this fantastic through They had like no time together. Barely any. They're not, they really don't, they barely count as a trio. Heck, Megami and Yuji barely count as a duo. They are co-workers. So, it makes sense that after slaughtering the one thing he generally cares for with his own technique as he sees it, and how Sukuna saw that he would see it, and also possibly offing his father figure, that yeah, he'd be a little bit too angry and a little bit too sad to not, to come back so easily. Sure, does that mean he's going to risk slaughtering everybody else? Absolutely. Is this still a mistake on Megami's part? Absolutely. Will I still critique Megami for this? Absolutely. Because we've lost so many people for him. But still, it makes sense within the character, right? Like, I'm not... Don't don't let the memership or the jokes or anything like that detract from the fact that I understand the character writing here. And I even like it. It makes sense. And honestly, it makes... If you're gonna give him sentience back immediately after all those limited voids, make him be a roadblock in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm down with that. I'm leaning with it, and I'm rocking with it. So that's fine. That's fine. Don't don't think I'm suddenly all, Oh, gosh darn it. Why didn't Megami immediately wake up and immediately come fight back and merge time? Like, that's fine. That's fine. I'm more than happy with it. Of course, he still fumbled, though. Because we see that Ryoman Sukuda, since Yuta did not spam both the sure hit, since he, I pre guess he just flat out turned it off, after that first hit, to try and save Megami, Sukuna gets the chance out. Dragon scale, ever-shifting moon, shatter creation itself, and boom! How could they do him like this? Yeah. So, Yuta Kotsu, the strongest sorcerer of today, falls just like the previous strongest sorcerer of today, to a spatial slash. Now, to, oh jeez, to huff copium, tough extreme copium, tough next level copium, tough copium of copium. I'm gonna... <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can hear my brain, like, trying try to do the dial-up, like, actually, how how are we gonna huff this one? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how, how, in fact, are we going to huff this copium? But, to huff, as, as a prime serial huffer that I am, there is still hope. Now, the thing is, we see it tear all the way through. It's a question of, did it clean cut? It should have, right? It's spatial slash. And Yuta is smaller than Gojo. But remember, this Sukuna's output is so deep in the trash that it's still possible he could have lived. And notably, unlike Satoru, despite him literally falling backwards, he doesn't, like... Like, this is Yuta. He doesn't... He doesn't immediately fall backwards. So maybe he's still alive, but maybe he's cooked. Because once again, a lot of people were calling it. I didn't mention it in any of my videos, but I was kind of I saw what people were talking about it and I kinda agreed. You to falling on Valentine's Day? What kind of irony is that? But also 
I would have hope. I'd have more hope and more cope if one, it didn't seem like this went straight through his arm guard right here. And also, it cut off the ring hand. That's the big, it cut off the ring hand. That's a major issue. Because I was huffing cope. And once again, this does seem to confirm that this was just a mistake. Like I mentioned a few chapters back, or not a few chapters back, I think like two chapters back when you'd open domain. For some reason, he put the ring on his middle finger. Unless he randomly changed it like off panel where I just missed the panel where he changed the ring. It's on his ring finger now, so I think Gage just made an art mistake there. It's fine. Gage makes art mistakes all the time. Not all the time, but consistently enough that it's not too surprising to me. But the main thing here is that his ring hand is cut off. So what Colby was huffing in the quick review was like, well, look, this reek is not fully manifested. So like maybe she'll fully manifest and like hold Duda together as a certain someone pops in and holds somebody off and then bada bing bada boom. But with the ring being sliced off from Rika not being fully manifested it's looking kind of rough though admittedly this is I wonder what the lineup is I'm very I'm gonna see when the chapter is fully cleaned up and everything I'm a little confused on this like correct me if I'm wrong but like these are multiple different slashes right like that like Yuji and Yuda seem to have one clean slash don't be wrong like this is a clean slash even though it's hitting his arm and then his chest it's a spatial slash it's gonna go through all of that which, once again, kind of confirms that Spatial Slash is either bigger than we thought, and or it does travel. Either one is fine. It just means, man, Gojo, how'd you fumble? But with that being the case, Yuji seems to have one clean slash. Yuta seems to have one clean slash. It's Rika who's confusing me here? Like, she has a slash here, a slash here. She's coughing up something here, which presumably is also another slash, because I don't think Curses bleed. It's like, actually, no, Curses do bleed, at least in the anime. So, I don't know. Very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Yuta being alive or gone? Hmm. I'm leaning towards him being alive, though, because Yuji also has to be alive, right? Like, and they seem to have similar amounts of bulk. And as long as he slides that hand back on and starts to heal and or switches hands or switches the ring hand, he should be able to get back up, especially since it looks like Sukuna is going to be distracted for a little while. As, while well, the domain of the new strongest of the modern day falls, someone comes in to greet the king of curses before he can capitalize on this moment this moment of success this moment of triumph this moment where the king himself stands supreme he is reminded of he who came before him in a way that he would never understand nor recognize for from the shadows waiting watching and lurking is none other than the ghost of the zen in himself who pierces Sukuna straight through the chest with the blade that dices apart the very astral form of beings. Ladies and gentlemen, Maki Zenin has arrived. And it's time for her to cook. Now! Unfortunately, 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 not while well, I am freaking and geeking, because I'm going to spend hell here! I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost myself there with that. But of course, I'm more than happy that Maki's here, but... I want you to go back in time for a minute and remember the last ghost who did this. Yeah, um, y'all remember how, uh, Toji pierced Gojo on the back and, like, didn't go for that? Maki did the same thing. Emily with a better sword. This this seems to be soul split. We can't see if it's soul split, but like it seems to have the shape of soul split. Why would she not use soul split? Like I've done what for what reason would she not use it? Actually, no, that is just soul split. Like you see the feathery cloth here. So she uses soul split. But like she goes for the back. And maybe this is still all attempt to save Megami time. But uh, like like come on now, Maki. You know better. Like, like and the reason I say that so particularly is because Sugana can just keep fighting. Like, like, this is... And, like, notably, what worries me the most about Maki is, one, she's likely going to be running the runs at least for a little bit. At least for what it seems like, all our other characters are down for the count. Like, this is Yuta, slashed in half. This is Rika, slashed in ace. And this is Yuji, slashed in half. Meaning Maki's going to have to run the ones. And don't get me wrong, this is the best case for Maki to run ones, Right? One, Sukuna still can't perceive her, most likely. At best, he can perceive the blade, but not her. Who knows how much that, diff how much of a difference that's going to make. If we go with the fact that Yuda may have only gotten stronger defensively, 
and speed wise he's still the same then who knows maki and sukuna may be able to go bar for bar relative for relative once again sukuna has a lot of properties of heavenly restriction users he has precog he has air hopping he has a lot of weird things that only heavenly restriction users have so seeing them go head to head bar for bar is going to be very very interesting i can't wait to see that but considering the fact that sukuna is smiling here and the fact that maki did not go for the head and the fact that i still especially the reason i'm ex extra worried for maki the last fingers off the table you'd have ate it the last fingers off the table there's no like oh well, we could defeat this sukuna and then we have another sukuna as a bat no 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 it's just this one and i don't see maki beating this sukuna not narratively i just don't think it would make sense it would kind of make sense and like oh in like a transcendental narrative scene if yuji wasn't our main character then maybe it makes sense but with the context of yuji being our main character Despite Maki's whole narrative being about the destruction of the old ways, destruction of the Jutsu world, tearing down all of its fundamental properties until there's nothing left but what she herself desires, despite that being a massive part of her narrative and her being very, very important, I'm not seeing the vision, ladies and gentlemen. Not for Maki. And I know that sounds so bad, right? Because, like, I love Maki, but I see her going relative with an extremely weakened su Sukuna. Unfortunately, as much as a Maki meat muncher and Toji toe licker as I am, just as I cannot really give Yuta and Yuji much credit for their insane feats this chapter of knocking around and drawing juice from Sukuna, I'm not going to be able to give Maki much credit considering she's going up against the possibly outside of like maybe end of Gojo fight Sukuna, the weakest variation of Sukuna we've seen. Like notably, let me see, does Bro even have his arms back or his lower tongue back? Nope. Arm missing, but it's healing. This arm slowly healing back, but still. And it looks like his tongue is still gone. So like, this is like one of the weakest variations of Sukuna with some of the least cursed energy output and or body control ever. So she does great here. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to love seeing Maki cook. But I think on a scaling front, this still won't mean much. Which is unfortunate. Which is unfortunate. But I hope she lives. I'm really hoping she lives. I'm hoping Yuta lives. I'm hoping everybody lives from this point on. <laughs> Please, Genki, stop taking characters. However... If you made it all the way to the end of this spoiler discussion, this hefty little boy, please leave the Pierced King. And I ain't talking about his earrings. I'm talking about the Pierced King in the comment section down below. I do thank you so much for watching. Please to leave a like, share, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do happen to have a Patreon down below where you can support me for as little as one, kind of one, dollar, things like exclusive videos, early content, and more. You also become a member of the channel for as little as three dollars a month to get the same perks and more. So those perks include the live reaction to this very chapter, along with ad-free variations of all my videos, along with the possibility that if you become a $25 patron or a $25 member, you can order any video you want. Literally anything. I will have to do it. It'll be my binding vow. But with that being the case, thank you so much for watching. Once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is Dad with a Pencil, writing off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three dollar members, Reconner Plays, Red Bull, Four Seven Six Five, Greyhound, and Akids Void. And I'd like to give another thank you to our five dollar patrons, Victor, Sean, RNG Master, Midnight Lord Twenty One. Kevin, Igneal, and Demix LNT. I'd like to give another thank you to our $7 members, Autumn Mornings Lazo, Sick Addiction, and Jan Tomas. I'd like to give another thank you to our $10 patrons, Rami Uchiha and Joaquin. I'd like to give another thank you to our $25 member, Alex Ice Rose. I'd like to give a hefty, my apologies, I'd like to give a hefty thank you to our $25 patron, Winter. I'd like to give another gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, Steeron. I'd like to give another humongous thank you to our $25 patron, Ehack1. I'd like to give another scrumdily umptious thank you to our $25 patron, China Doll 9 I'd like to give a final and Thank you to our final $25 member, Calvin Elder.